Welcome to those of you watching at home or online. Uh, today we're launching a six-week series that explores the key themes in the, in the book of Daniel. And we, we're very excited about it. I saw some ladies this morning that could barely contain themselves. They're so excited. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled to get, get there with you and study this. Um, we're we're going to look at everything. We're going to discuss the sovereignty of God. Um, we're going to discuss the importance of our faithfulness to God, and then we'll most certainly see that, and we'll be assured of God's redemptive plan for humanity, and so I'm excited to show those things to you. And uh, I believe that by looking at the life of one man, one guy, that we can see how incredibly powerful it is, what it looks like to be a person of high character, living faithfully to God in a hostile culture. And look, I believe you're blind if you don't see that our culture is growing increasingly hostile towards God and Christians. I mean, I also don't really feel great about where we are because I don't see an overwhelming amount of believers that are acting like God is sovereign over it all. I mean, they might say it in church. They, they, they might even like shout an amen when the preacher gets rolling, right? But then they go out and they act like someone else or something else is sovereign, See, Daniel lived in a culture that was hostile towards him and God, and he continued to make decisions that clearly show and confirm who Daniel believes to be king. See, character is everything. Integrity matters. And as culture continues to drift further and further from God, we as followers of Christ must understand that we are being watched. We are. And even if you don't like buying our t-shirts from the merch shop and wearing them to work, which you should be, okay, if you haven't already, go buy one, all right? But even if you're not into that, right, your coworkers, your family members, your friends, your neighbors, they will, if you're following Christ, they will eventually find out that you're a Christian and they'll tune in and watch. You want to know what they're looking for? They're looking for you to slip up. Seriously, they're looking for you to mess up because your mess up helps them justify theirs. Well, you know, Mike claims to be a Christian, but he did this. I saw him. We must, folks, as followers of Christ, we must do our best to ensure that we're not giving them that reason, that excuse. And I, I get it. Look, I, I get the pressure of that. That is a heavy burden to carry. And that's why character matters. That's why character is everything. That's why integrity matters. What kind of character do you have? Are you a person with integrity? Not sure? Here's how you can find out, all right? Who are you when there is no one around you to try and impress? When you're all alone, no one's looking, what do you do? That's your character. And here's the thing. It requires a strong dose of honesty and self-awareness to determine your true character because you must answer one very simple question. What would you do if you could do anything, anything you wanted, and no one would ever know? Would things shift in your life to accommodate that opportunity? What, what would you do with a free pass? That's the real you. Not the one you share online, but the one you keep secret offline. I asked my son the other day, I, I said, Nolan, why, why do you not steal? And he kind of looked at me funny. He's like, Dad, like, that's an easy question. Can you ask me something harder? You know what I mean? He said straight up, he's like, because it's wrong. You, you taught me it's wrong. I know God says that it's wrong. We're, we're, we're not supposed to steal. That's a seven-year-old. Okay, he gets it. A poll was done uh, some time ago, and it asked uh, adult Americans why they don't steal. And the number one response was, anyone want to take a stab at it? They're afraid to get caught. See, here's the thing. If your reason for not stealing is getting caught, then what happens when you think you might not get caught? You're going to steal? Maybe stealing isn't it for you, though. Maybe if you think you can cheat on your wife and she'll never know. Will you go ahead and do it? If you think you can visit that website and no one will ever find out, will you click on it? And look, I'm not saying that fear is a bad deterrent. I'm saying integrity is a better one. What are you? Who are you 
when you're all alone. It has been said that if you accept the thought, you are likely to accept the act that comes after the thought. And if you accept the act, then you're likely to accept the habit too. And if you accept the habit, you're likely to accept the character or lack thereof. It starts here in the mind. Today we're focusing on Daniel 1, and here we find four men who had character. They were Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, the prophet. You know their names, right? And when we hear their names, we immediately think of the fiery furnace and the fourth in the fire, and it's a great story. Or when we hear the name Daniel, our our mind recalls the night that he cuddled up next to some 420-pound cats and lived to tell about it. And those things did happen. And they are cool. But what I want you to see is that the kind of character that gave three Hebrew teenagers the strength to stand up for God, even as they stared death in the face, that kind of character must be developed and built over time. See, the kind of character that gave Daniel the courage to keep praying, even if it meant becoming a snack for Mufasa, right? God, God had been preparing that in him from a very young age. And a lot of times, you don't know whether you have that kind of character until you know you have that kind of character. You with me? I pray I have that kind of character. I pray that my faith can persevere through it all. And while character may be revealed in these monumental moments, it's developed in the little ones. And that's what I want you to see today. That's what I want you to see throughout this series We're going to read about these incredible things that God's going to do through these young men. But don't forget, if you want God to work in the big stuff, you need to let him work in the small stuff too. Here's the timeline. The Israelites were taken into captivity by Babylon for 70 years. And among them were the four men that we're going to discuss throughout this series. And what's amazing about the Israelites' captivity is that the Lord warned them that it would happen if they did not repent. They, they had to know it was coming, right? Yet time and time again, the nation of Israel, the people of God, turned to worship idols instead of God. And God warned them that he would judge them for their actions. Check this out. The prophet Jeremiah said, therefore, the Lord Almighty says this. Because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now let's just, let me get apologetic on you for a second, okay, if that's, if that's all right. If, if, if you doubt the reliability of scripture, Like, first of all, I'm glad you're here. Like, you came to the right place, you know. But if you've been struggling, if you've been doubting it lately, let me just lay this before you. This prophecy was given way before the event actually happened. This gives Scripture an enormous amount of credibility. Let me explain it like this. There's a tweet floating around that you you have to know about if you're keeping up with the Phoenix Suns and their their title run. Um, Check this out. I'll put it up on the screen for you. This man predicted the NBA Finals matchup for 2021 back on November 3rd, 2016. See the date post on the the tweet there? That's incredible. He called it. And and we look at the odds of that and we're like, dang. Like, this guy's for real, right? And we'll see if he's right about it going to Game 7. I don't think it's going to go to Game 7. And even if it does go to Game 7, we'll see if he's right about the score, right? But even just to, to, to get the teams right is impressive, right? The Bible has around 1,800 prophecies. A vast majority of those prophecies have been fulfilled with the remaining unfulfilled prophecies predicting the end times, which we believe have yet to happen. So the internet loses its mind when one guy predicts one NBA Finals matchup five years before it happens, while in the same breath dismissing 1,700 accurate predictions in the Holy Scriptures. Go figure. So God's people won't give up their idols 
So God gives them a nation of idols. See, the king of Babylon, he decided that he, he, he wanted some of Israel's best and brightest to join his ranks so that he could indoctrinate them into his pagan beliefs. And so King Nebuchadnezzar's desire, he, he, he wanted to eradicate any connection between God and his people. And in this series, we're going to see how that worked out for the king of Babylon. Follow along with me. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So, you know, like guys like me, all right? I'm kidding. <laughs> he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Wow. So these four men were brought into the palace of the king and were given new names. That was their Jewish names. Look, you know things are dire when you're being renamed. Like, like, you know you're in hostile territory when your name causes people discomfort. That, that's what this was. Because Daniel's name meant God is my judge. They changed his name to Belshazzar, which was to honor some false god. Hananiah's name meant beloved of the Lord. Again, these are capital G's and capital L's. Right? How beautiful is that? Beloved of the Lord. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun god. Mishael meant who is like God. His name was changed to Meshach, which honors the moon god. Yet another lowercase g god. Azariah's name meant the Lord, capital L, is my judge, and his name was changed to Abednego. You guessed it, yet another nod to a false god. It was intentional. It was hostile. These young men were teenagers, around 17 years old. Their entire world flipped upside down in an instant. They were ripped away from their family. They were ripped away from their culture. They were ripped away from other believers, and they were put in a palace where they weren't even permitted to keep the name that they were given as a child. Maybe some of you have had this life-altering event in your life. Maybe not to that degree but maybe your parents got divorced or your spouse left. Or maybe your last child just moved out of town. Or maybe you were just let go from your job. Something happened and it just flipped your world upside down. Listen to me. Don't you ever forget this. God is with you. God is with you. God is in the fire with you, and there are a lot of things that we can lose in this life, but nothing, hear me when I tell you, nothing can take you from his hand. Nothing. Do you believe that? These four men had character. The king thought he could remove them from family, remove them from friends, and indoctrinate them into the Babylonian lifestyle. But I don't care if you rename someone. You can't change what a person is on the inside. You can't change who they are, and you definitely can't change whose they are. That's why character is everything. That's why integrity matters. I think now, more than ever, we can say that we know what it's like to live in a hostile environment. Folks, the United States of America was founded on Christian values and principles. And it helped shape, hear me, it helped shape this nation to be the greatest nation this world has ever seen. 
a nation under God, has become a nation hostile to God. You do. You live in a culture that attacks your faith. It attacks who you are. You live in a culture that would like to give you a new name. Right? It mocks you for living according to the word. It, it, it talks down to you for wanting to do what God's word tells you to do. We, we, aren't, we aren't unable to relate to Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego here. We, we understand what they're going to. Maybe not to the extremes, but we, we get it. But listen to me. They were ready. They were ready for it. They knew who God was and they, they, they knew of his promises and they rested in that as they endured incredibly difficult circumstances. Please, if, if you get nothing else today, walk away with this. God adores your efforts at faithfulness. God adores your effort at faithfulness. And that's, that's what we're seeing here from these young men. They refused to compromise, even in the small things. And so when the big stuff came, they were ready. The first scuffle with the king was on the topic of food, specifically the king's food. See, the law that God handed down to the Israelites through Moses to the nation of Israel, it forbid certain foods. And so these young men, in their mind, eating it would be a compromise. But look at this, verse 8. If, if, if there is one verse that defines the entire book of Daniel, it is right here. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Kind of read that and it hit me. I love it that it says he asked for permission. Like, hear me out. Followers of Christ should be the best citizens. Like, I can't underscore that enough. I don't, I don't care how hostile that nation might be. I don't care how horrible the leadership of that nation might be. Followers of Christ should be the best citizens. While Daniel refuses to compromise and be indoctrinated, he isn't using it as a reason to go polish off his favorite pitchfork. That's not what he's at. He, he's thoughtful. He's intentional. But he's not aggressive. I just thought that was interesting. I like that, that line, that he asked for permission. But this isn't just about food, right? This was an incredible opportunity for these young men. I mean, to be in the palace at all meant that you were in a position to climb the ranks, right? They could be the, personals, the, the king's personal assistants in a week if they, if they play their cards right, right? Three years at the longest. Captivity to royalty. This was the path that they were being offered. It's incredible. It'd be like your boss offering to take you to lunch, right? Like you're not going to tell him, oh, sorry, man, I had plans to hit up in and out with Bob from accounting. No, forget Bob, right? Like you're going with your boss. You might even offer to drive. You'll let him pay, of course, right? But, but you're going to sit down and you're going to do your best to try to impress your boss. Here's what's going down here. Their faith was more important to them than anything they had or anything they could possibly gain. Is that true for you? Because a lot of times Christians want to know what they can do and still be a Christian. Like, can I do this and still be a Christian? Like, and, and that question is so far from where you want to be. Like, people who have been saved by grace don't ask, what can I get away with and still go to heaven? People saved by grace ask, what can I do to better know the one that saved me? <laughs> that said, there are legitimate things that we wonder about as Christians. And it does. It leads to some questions. Is it right for you to do this as a Christian? Is it, is it right for you to do that? Is this allowed? Is that allowed? Or is this a sin? All right? And maybe we don't know what God's word says, or maybe God's word isn't really clear, and so we ask the questions. And I, I just want to say I think it's great that we ask the questions. But sometimes there are things that there are things someone can do, and it won't harm them, but it might harm, harm someone around them. Kristen and I have been married for 10 years. Uh, we celebrate 10 years um, this October. And I'm going to let you in on one of my biggest frustrations with her, Okay. I'm going to be in trouble. She can eat whatever she wants and not pay the price. It's infuriating. Like, I'm angry. Like, seriously, waffles, 
cheesecake, chicken nuggets, all of it. All the fun stuff. And she could just be fine. It's like, really? If I look at cake wrong, I gain five pounds. Just look at it. <laughs> I, I, also, I also have a family history of diabetes. You know, she does not. And so, so the risk is inherently greater for me the more that I consume those incredibly tasty things, right? And so I just have to approach that different than her. That's my reality. Doesn't mean she's right. Doesn't mean I'm wrong. It just means we're different, right? See, if you, if you want to know what's okay and what's not okay as a follower of Christ, then ask yourself a few questions, okay? And I, I can't say what was stirring through Daniel's mind here when he asked for permission not to defile himself, but I got to think it was something along these lines. Number one, ask yourself, is God in this? Is God in this? Is, is it, will this build up my affections for God? Is this me drawing near to him? Put it this way, there's a difference between holding a glass of wine and, and, and smelling it and, and, and celebrating God for his provisions that, that go together and the effort involved so, so that you can enjoy a glass of wine. There is a difference between that and hooking yourself up to an IV. Just saying. There's a difference. Number two, you need to ask yourself, does, that threaten, does it threaten to hold you captive? Right? And the idea here is simple. Do you risk dethroning God and making this an idol? You've got to ask yourself. The third question to ask yourself is, do you feel good about it? Okay? Like, like, you have a guide. Okay? If you are following Christ, you have a guide. The Spirit of God exists in you to convict you and guide you towards holiness. Refer back to question one. Is God in this? And here's the question that many Christians miss. Number four, will this cause someone around me to stumble. A lot of us forget that one. And listen to me, if you aren't concerned about your decision-making impacting someone else, then you aren't anywhere close to understanding the call on your life as a follower of Christ. You're not anywhere close. Paul talks about this in his first letter to the Corinthians. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things Build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Similar to when you decided to get married. You guys remember? You remember when you decided in your, that you wanted that from life? Yeah? What you probably didn't realize was that marriage comes with a shift. It comes with a lot of shifts, but this one was especially eye-opening for me. See, before you were married, you had one person to consider in your choices. You remember that? Good old days, huh? I'm just kidding. It's, it, well, it was fun. It was fun. Now, all of a sudden, you got to worry about somebody else, right? You got to consider someone else. It's like, what? What? Right? And don't get me started on having kids. Now, you got to worry about two more, three more. Stop. If you're a follower of Christ, you no longer get to consider only yourself and your decisions. You don't. Don't drag you down. Don't drag them down. Don't cause a brother to sin. See, these young men, they took a stand in what seems like a small area. It does. It seems insignificant. What's the big deal, Daniel? Like, just eat the food. After all, it's not like it's going to change who you are. But it's not about the food. It matters because small things become bigger things, and character is developed in the little things, and it's revealed in the big things. And is this even a small thing? I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar was intimidating. Dude was crazy. I used to think my dad's stare was bad. You remember your dad's stare, your old man's stare coming at you? Like you just he didn't have to say anything. You just know. Like, I'm about to get beat down, right? I, I you know, don't pop, a, don't pop a vein, dad, you know? Now I give that look to my son. He knows what that look is. So despite our best efforts, we all grow up to be our parents, right? Anyways. King Nebuchadnezzar was cruel, and he was powerful. Listen to me, after capturing Israel, um, he had the king of Israel's sons brought to him, and then he killed them in front of their father, and then he gouged out their dad's eyes. Now, he's not the kind of guy you want to get all stirred up, right? He's irrational, he's unpredictable, and he's violent. 
Yet, verse 8, one version says, look at this, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself. Like, there are some things that God can't do for you. You have to choose them on your own. There just are. See, Daniel knew that this was the call on his life, and he stood strong. He was determined not to defile himself. Listen to me. There are some things you can't do for you. Only God can do. Look at this. Let's see what happens. Verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who had assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the younger men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked to them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Check it out. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in this entire kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Man, we need more of that in our country and our churches. It's so hard to find men and women with conviction these days, let alone courage. See, Daniel had conviction. He had purpose. He knew exactly what he was there to do, but he had the courage to back it up. Love it. See, this back and forth about the menu Reminds me of a very simple yet powerful truth. A little with God is better than a lot without him. It just is. Raw veggies with God is better than a bacon-wrapped steak without him. Like, I'd rather be in an old, rickety boat navigating a storm alongside Jesus than in a penthouse with a butler named Alfred without him. All day. Folks, That's what Daniel determined in verse 8. That's why verse 8 is the foundation for everything you'll see in Daniel. That's what he was determined to preserve. That's what his purpose was. Daniel knew that there was nothing that this world could offer that compares to what God offers. Nothing. Hear me out. Sooner or later, you're going to be invited to dine at the king's table. You with me? Like, like sooner or later, you're going to be presented with a choice. Someone will say, hey, look, this is, <clears throat> this is how this is now. This is groupthink, right? This is how everyone thinks. This is politically correct. You have to agree with us. This is, or we'll cancel you. You have to. You can't be walking around saying, well, the Bible says this. What? No, that's no longer accepted. You, you, you have to conform. You have to say what we say. You have to do what we do. You have to treat people the way that we treat them. Some of you, God bless you, but some of you will say, sorry, the Bible says something different, and I'm going to follow what God says in his word. In the face of pressure from peers and from culture, what will you choose? Will you fall in line? Or will you stand strong? I'm not asking you to go home and think about it. Like the decision happens right here, right now. You'll either compromise to fit into the socially accepted norm or you'll stand strong and you'll stand firm in God's word. So yeah, you should sweat the small stuff. You should. So what will it be for you? 
veggies and water or steak and wine? Decide now whether you'll stand strong. Decide. I mean, think, do you think Daniel stood a chance against a den of hungry lions if he didn't turn down the delicacies of the palace? For real? Start small. Develop character. And there will come that big moment when your character will be revealed. But it starts here. What are you determined to do? Care to venture a guess what Paul's mind was set on when he wrote to the Philippians? He said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Wow. Paul lived and breathed Christ. He trusted, loved, served, and shared and was devoted to Christ in all things. Christ was his only hope, his only purpose, and his only reason to live. He preached Christ. He was persecuted for Christ, and he ultimately would die for Christ. If you are in Christ, what could you possibly lose? Over the years, the story has been told of a Christian who was arrested and brought before the authorities, and he was told to renounce his faith. The ruler told the Christian, he said, give up Christ or I'll banish you. The Christian said, you can't banish me from Christ, for he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The ruler said, I'll confiscate your property. The Christian said, my treasures are laid up in heaven. You can't touch them. The ruler said, then I'll kill you. The Christian said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You can take my life, but you can't keep it. And the ruler turned to his wise men and he said, what can you do with such a man? You, nothing. You can't take from someone who has nothing to lose. We need more men and women like that. We do. We need more men and women who would rather have veggies with God than dine among royalty without him. If you're anything like me, you read this first chapter in Daniel and you have but one question. When faced with the decision, will I choose the king's table or his table? I mean, you think Daniel... <laughs> I laugh when you think Daniel knew that he and the boys would look like the rock on arm day after 10 days of veggies. No, come on. They didn't know. They trusted in God's provisions well before God ever provided. It's not likely, though, that your next test will be against a powerful leader looking to indoctrinate you. Maybe, but I don't I don't think it'll be your test. But I promise you Temptation is coming. Compromise will present itself. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? Are you ready for the heat? See, we'll learn in the next few chapters, we'll see this, but the key to Daniel's success wasn't his four years in Jewish prep school. Right? It wasn't the three best friends that anyone could have, and it wasn't even the foundation set by his godly parents. Those things helped, yes, but it was his radical trust and his unmatched faithfulness to God that saw him through these years in captivity. See, faithfulness to God looks like this. It is the daily acknowledgement that God is sovereign over all things. In this case, God provides physical strength despite a 10-day protein deficit. Research shows that muscle size can decrease by 15% after just 10 days. But God doesn't really care about what research says. Like, let me ask you, has your world been flipped up, upside down? Are you in hostile territory? Like, don't forget, you're not alone. God will both recognize and respond to your faithfulness. Did you hear me? God will both recognize and respond to your faithfulness. <sighs> Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hebrews 13 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because 
God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Daniel was faithful in the small stuff. Instead of trying to get away with the small stuff like many of us often do, he refused to compromise. He took a stand. That's what I'd like to ask you to do today, right now. I'd like to ask you to identify something in your life that you have compromised on. I get it. Look, it might be small. And yes, you might know other believers that do it and they justify it and their justification might be rock solid to you, but this isn't about them. This is about you. Somewhere deep down inside, you have this conviction that's stirring in you that's saying this is wrong. I understand it might be small, but it's keeping you from relying on God's provisions instead of your own, which means it's not small. I'm asking you to make a stand there because if you compromise in that, then you'll compromise somewhere else. And where will it end? If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had eaten from the, from the king's table, if they would have made that compromise, do you really think that they would have stood tall in a sea of Israelites and refused to bow when the golden idol anthem came on? No way they stand. No way. If Daniel hadn't made his stance, do you, do you think that he would have had the courage to continue to pray after a law had been passed to cease all prayer? I mean, we're talking 10 days without protein compared to one night in a den with hungry 400-pound lions. Take your pick. See, the stand you make now will determine what you stand for tomorrow. But before you can stand, we need to talk about who you're standing for. The most important decision you'll make in your life is to choose Jesus Christ and to make him your Lord and your Savior. I want to talk about making him your Savior. I want you to know that Christ died for sinners. And like I said before, there are things that God does and things you do. God is the only one that can forgive you of your sin. Christ made that possible. You are the only one that can repent of your sin. See, making Jesus your Savior is simple. Just go to God in prayer. Tell God that you're a sinner in need of his grace and ask God to forgive you. And like so many of us in this room have done, ask him to forgive you and he will forgive you. And once forgiven, you become a child of God. All children of God are saved by grace through faith alone. There are no promotions in the kingdom of God. The highest rank that you can achieve is sinner saved by grace. Now, you aren't called to live in perfection. You are called to live in pursuit. Which brings us to Jesus Christ as Lord. You cannot have just Jesus as Savior. That's not how this works. A lot of people struggle with this. This is hard for a lot of us because you were once king, but now you're forfeiting the throne to Christ. Your pursuit of Christ is fueled by your experience with grace, and it's achieved by the denial of yourself. I've seen a man leave this world not knowing Christ, and I've seen faith giants leave this world with absolute certainty of their future home. These young men in Daniel 1, they knew God. <laughs> they were confident of what they had in him. They were confident in the promises to come. And it's because of their confidence that they could stare death in the face, even in what many of us would call small things, like their diet. Can you do that? See, if your pursuit is not Christ... You can't do that, and you won't. 